Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all here to our service of worship as we gather to gather gather together to worship God. As is always, it is my prayer that you will be blessed and that God will be glorified. And if any visitors amongst us this day, that you are particularly welcome. Uh, I have a couple of items, uh, a couple of things to bring to your attention by way of announcements. Uh, first, first one of which is not actually on the announcement sheet, uh, and that is that could I ask the congregation committee, members of the congregation committee, to remain behind briefly after the service for an impromptu committee meeting. So, comm- members of the committee, just remain behind for a very brief uh, uh, committee meeting. And then items that are on the announcement sheet. There are a number of items listed on there. You'll see that, for instance, our, the, the choir practice will take place a, uh, a, a, a tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. in preparation for our harvest Thanksgiving services, which will take place the following weekend, uh, our normal morning and afternoon. Uh, well, in, in the evening speaker being, Sunday evening speaker being the Reverend Robert McFall. And the Monday, the 10th of October, being a uh, Reverend Roger Michael So Please can I encourage you to come out to those services n- in next weekend. As usual, our midweek will meet uh, this incoming Wednesday at 8 p.m. Once again, it will be via Zoom and in person uh, over in Glen Hoy Presbyterian Church if you're able uh, to come along in person or join via Zoom. Can I encourage you to do so? And I can also encourage our young members of the congregation not just to think of the midweek as something that you have to be 30 plus to attend uh, or indeed 40 plus to attend. Can I encourage you, it's open to all to come along and to join with us either virtually or in person and can I encourage you to do that as we continue to look at the book of Hebrews. You'll see on the screen there a beacon, our youth service, that'll be this evening at 7.30 p.m in uh, uh, Glen Hoy, so can I encourage all our young people to attend to that? Somebody's agreeing out there with a, either a car alarm or somebody's on the horn. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, somebody's getting their car robbed. There's one of you all not rushing out the door now to see whose car's getting nicked. Uh, uh, so Beacon, 7.30 p.m. this evening. Can I encourage you to uh, broadcast, uh, publicise that and, and indeed pray for that. And then another uh, uh, initiative that's coming uh, uh, is our TN3. Our little, the TN3 is our Senior Citizens Initiative. Uh, you'll see the details of it there in, uh, in, on, in, on your announcement sheet. Our Senior Citizens Initiative, uh, our first meeting will be on Thursday the 20th of October, 3 to 4.30 p.m. Uh, people who attend can enjoy tea, coffee, biscuits, topical talks, various activities, and, and time to chat. It'll be held on the third Thursday of each month, uh, unless otherwise stated thereafter. And the next planning meeting to finalise details for this will be on Thursday the 6th of October here in the Minor Hall. So uh, yeah, please can I ask those who are helping out with that, leaders of that, to come along to that meeting. But there are flyers for this down in the vestibule. Can I encourage you to take them, uh, one of them, and to pass those around. Our next and other initiative is our uh, uh, Harry Ferguson evening, and that's going to be on Friday the 14th at 8 p.m. in Clougher Mart. George Conn, the guest speaker, the details are on there. There are flyers for you to pick up. Can I encourage you to take them and to publicise this and indeed to pray for this event? Our youth club will meet on this incoming Friday, 7 through to 8 30 p.m. All leaders are requested to meet beforehand at 6 40 to help with setup. Uh, and one other item the Sazer prayer letter for October is now available in the vestibule so if you pray for the work of Sazer can I encourage you to do so and if you've never prayed for the so- uh, work of the soldiers and airmen scripture readers association please can I encourage you to do so and pick one of uh, uh, pick one of those up on your way out those are all the announcements As we approach God in worship, I'm going to read to you now from Psalm 111, just to refocus our minds. Praise the Lord. I will extol the Lord with all my heart, in the counsel of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord, they are pondered by all who delight in them. 
majestic, and glorious and majestic are his deeds, and his righteousness endures forever. He has caused his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He provides food for those who fear him. He remembers his covenant forever. He has shown his people the power of his works, giving them the lands of other nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are steadfast forever and ever, done in faithfulness and uprightness. He provided redemption for his people. He ordained his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. And to him belongs eternal praise. Let us therefore give voice to our praise of Almighty God as we stand to sing our opening hymn, O Worship the King. Come before God in prayer now. Let us all pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we come before you now, we thank and praise you for this another day. 
in which you have blessed us so much already. We give you thanks for your generosity towards us, your compassion for us, your faithfulness to us, your patience with us, and your completely undeserved mercy for us. We give you thanks that you do not treat us as our sins deserve, and that whilst we still have life this side of eternity, you offer us the means of salvation. We give you thanks that whilst we do not and will not ever warrant your forgiveness, you promise to do exactly that if we humbly confess our sins before you and seek forgiveness in Christ's name. We give you thanks that your forgiveness is not partial but complete, not gradual but immediate, and not temporary but eternal. We give you thanks that in Christ we have a new creation, and we are a new creation, no more in condemnation. We give you thanks that in Christ we have a Saviour who cannot fail us. He is our rock and our refuge an ever-present help in trouble, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. We give you thanks that in Christ we are transformed from hell-bound sinners to heaven-bound saints, from beggars without bread to those who have riches beyond measure. But you do not bestow these things or these blessings upon us because of who we are, as though we are worthy or entitled to them. Instead you do so because of who you are, despite who we are. We give you thanks that no one who humbly bows before you is beyond salvation, for as your word reminds us, the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. But Heavenly Father, despite all that you have done for us, we confess that we remain stiff-necked and obstinate. We have not loved you nor served you as we ought. We have questioned your authority over us. We have doubted your integrity and ability. We have disobeyed you willfully and dishonoured you. We have trampled on your grace towards us, yielding to as opposed to fleeing from temptation. And we have nurtured our sinful nature as opposed to putting it to death. Forgive us, O Lord, for these and the many other sins we have committed in thought, word and deed through negligence and our own deliberate fault. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, All desires known and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. So we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to turn to God's word now. And as we continue with our look at the book of Genesis, our reading Today is taken from chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. So can I encourage you, if you have a Bible with you, to open your Bible at that particular passage. Genesis chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. And if you're using one of the Pew Bibles, you can find that reading on page 8. Genesis 6, beginning at verse 9. This is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people. For the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. 
This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and stored away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything, just as God commanded him. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven of every kind of clean animal, a male and his mate, and two of every kind of unclean animal, a male and his mate, and also seven of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now I will send rain on the earth, For forty days and forty nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and of all creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark as God had commanded Noah. And after the seven days, the floodwaters floodwaters came on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and rain fell on the earth for forty days and forty nights. On that very day Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings. Pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals in going in were male and female of every living thing, as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. For forty days the waters kept coming on the earth, And as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 20 feet. Every living thing that moved on the earth perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swam over the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. Men and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds of the air were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. And we end reading at verse 24 of chapter 7. And thank God for this reading from his truth. Now I'd like to speak to the young people. If they come down the front, I'm going to come down and speak with you. Any room, take a seat. I'm going to show you a picture. Can anybody tell me what you think that is? It's a bag, it is definitely a bag, but it's a special type of bag. Okay, to help you out, okay, there's material in that bag that if you were to jump out of a perfectly serviceable aircraft, Okay, the material of that in that bag would open out above your head and slow your descent down to earth. What do you think it is? 
That is correct. If you open up, pull up the next one. Okay, there's material in there, especially packed in, in a special way, that when you step out into the fresh air, that thing opens above your head into that big mushroom shaped thing and catches the air and slows you down. And, and parachutes are very good at what they do. Very good at what they do because they will slow you down from a speed of about 100 miles an hour to about 10 miles an hour to allow you to land safely on the ground. So if you're without a parachute, you will fall through the air at roughly 100 miles an hour or 120 if you go straight down. And that thing will slow you down to 10 miles an hour. Okay, and parachutes work in different ways. The two different main types. One type opens automatically. If you pull up the next picture, you see there that strap, that strap down the back of that parachute is what they call a static line, and that is attached to a big wire in the aircraft. You click it on above your head, and when you step out the door of the aircraft, it literally pulls the parachute out of the bag on your pack, on your back, and it opens above your head. And then there's another type which you have to open yourself. And when you have your parachute on, there's a, a handle about here on the strap. And when you get to a certain height, you have to pull it out and, and let go of it. And again, that opens the parachute and it lets you gen uh, float gently down to the earth. Now, some people uh, parachute for sport, for fun. Okay, they spend weekends doing it. Okay, other people parachute as part of their job. You saw that guy a few moments ago. Uh, yeah. That guy there, a paratrooper, that's part of their work. That's what they do for a living, for want of a better word. That's how they go and exercise. That's how they jump into countries. They do that as part of their job. And then other people, such as fighter pilots, only use a parachute in an emergency. Because if the aircraft gets damaged, they have to get out before it crashes. They jump out and the parachute deploys as part of their seat. Okay? Now, I say parachutes are very good at what they do. And you can... All those people who use them know that they save, will save their lives. But tell me this, does just knowing that a parachute is very good, does just knowing that a parachute will save your life, is that enough? Will it, will it save your life? For instance, if this was a parachute, okay, uh, and I wanted to jump out of an aircraft, what would I have to do in order for, it to, for me to save, for it to save my life? What do you think? What's the first thing I have to do? Well, that's a good, good, you would check it. Yes, you would check over to make sure there's not bits hanging out of it. Okay. It's not a bag of dirty washing you've got instead of a, par a parachute. Okay. Yes, that's one thing. What, I, what else do you think you need to do? I mean, if it just sits there and I jump out the door of the aircraft, will that save me? No, it won't. I need to put it on. Don't. So I, get, I put it on and I throw these straps over my shoulder. Now, I haven't done any of the straps up, but I've got my parachute on. Will that save me if I jump out the door of the aircraft? No, I need to put the straps on. There's on the parachute, you've got straps that go across your chest and you've got straps that come up between your legs and click in here and you need to tighten up and make sure they're nice and tight because if you don't put your straps on, what will happen? I can jump out with my parachute on. What would happen? It would fall off you exactly right. It would fall off you. The parachute would stay up there and you'd go down there. You'd slip out of the, out of the, out of the straps. Okay? And when you go parachuting... The straps are the things you always keep checking as you walk towards the door of the aircraft. Always convinced that they're a wee bit loose. Always tighten them to make sure they won't fall off you. Okay? But if your parachute is one of them ones, static line, okay? So, uh, so let, let's just think of it this way. If I just I put my parachute on now, can I just jump out the door? What do I need to do with it? What do I do that one there? What's it hook up to? What do you think? That cable that runs along the aircraft, what do you need to do to it? You need to hook it up, don't you? Because if I jump out the door of the aircraft with that thing stick, stuck in the back of the parachute, will it open? No, it won't open. I need to make sure it's attached to the aircraft. Or if I'm doing a bit of free falling and I have to open my parachute myself, I need to make sure I pull the handle. Okay, just wearing the parachute won't save you. You have to follow the instructions. You have to A, put it on and you have to do what it tells you. Just knowing about it won't save you. You have to do what it tells you. You have to follow the instructions for how to use it. And you know, as I think about parachutes and how they're very good at saving you, what they're designed to do, and how not just knowing about them won't save you. You have to use them as intended. 
It reminds me that in the Bible we learn that Jesus came into this world to die for our sins. The Bible tells us that knowing about him just isn't enough. I mean, you get taught about Jesus in Sunday school. You hear about him in church. But knowing about Jesus isn't enough. You have to do what the Bible tells you. You have to ask Jesus into your heart as your Savior. And Lord, you have to say sorry to God for your sins and ask Jesus to be your Savior. Jesus came to die for our sins to save us from our sins, but we have to he only do so if he is our saviour. And therefore we have to do what the Bible tells us. We have to follow the instructions the Bible gives us. I have to put this parachute on in order to save me, and in a simple way I have to put Jesus on in order to be saved from my sins. I have to ask him to be my saviour and say sorry to God. Now, if I step out of the aircraft without a parachute, I will plummet to the earth, but a parachute will save me. And I know that the Bible tells me that when I die, I can, only get, I can only get to heaven if Jesus is my Savior. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that Je- what Jesus, for what Jesus came to do. We thank you, Lord, that your Bible, your word tells us how he can become our Savior, by saying sorry to you and asking him to be our Savior. Lord, help us to remember that just simply knowing about him, learning about him in Sunday school and church is not enough. We have to, Lord, to have him as our saviour in order for him to save us. Amen. (coughs) You've been very good and you can head back to your seats. We're going to sing It's the Most Wonderful Thing. come before God in prayer once again. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we unite our hearts in prayer once more, we take this opportunity to remember the persecuted church, and in particular, your church in Libya today. Heavenly Father, as we think of that country, we think in particular of a brother in Christ there, who has recently been sentenced to death for converting from Islam to Christianity. We thank you for the example this believer is to all of us in remaining steadfast in his faith in Christ and for refusing to 
recant in order to be spared. Nevertheless, Lord, we pray that this death sentence will not be carried out and that our brother in Christ will be allowed to practice his Christian faith in peace. May, Lord, you sustain him and remain close to him. We also pray, Lord, for the country of Libya as a whole, following the civil war there and the political and legal turmoil that has resulted from this conflict. We pray, our Lord, that effective good government will be returned to Libya, being able to establish peace and stability in that country. With regards to our own nation, Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for our Prime Minister and her government as they attempt to stabilise the economy and deal with the international crisis caused by the war in Ukraine. Grant, O oh Lord, them the wisdom, courage and commitment, the commitment they need to do so effectively. We pray, Heavenly Father, also for the problems caused by the Northern Ireland Protocol. We ask, Lord, that they will be successfully sorted so as to enable this part of the United Kingdom to trade freely with the remainder of it. And then, Lord, we remember your church here in Clogher, and we seek, O Lord, your blessing upon all that we do here in your name for your kingdom. Heavenly Father, we live in difficult times where many of our young people, beguiled and deluded by the temporal charms of our society, have forsaken your way and therefore this church. Like so many others, O Heavenly Father, this church, Lord, like so many others, is missing the, the next generation of gospel torchbearers. So for your name's sake, O Lord, we pray that you would rescue and restore them and so enable this church to grow and thrive, O Lord, in this corner of your kingdom. And finally, Heavenly Father, we remember all those known to us in this fellowship and in the wider community who are currently unwell. Once again, Lord, we humbly request that you would lay your healing touch upon them and provide comfort and reassurance to their anxious loved ones. These things, Lord, we ask in our Saviour's name. Amen. We're now going to stand to sing, <clears throat> Break Forth, O Living Light of God.
Today we find ourselves looking at a portion of scripture which is arguably one of the most contested due to its content. It is also partly due to this that it is one of the most well known. There are those who believe that the events described in this portion of scripture are complete nonsense, the the product of an overactive imagination, whilst others believe them to be factual. However, even the people who believe them to be factual are divided into two camps. Because some will say that the flood was universal, whilst others will say that it was only regional. And whether we like to admit it or not, living in the culture in which we do, when we read these verses, we do so with one of these three opinions. So what are, do we, we, are, what are we to make of these verses? Well, to those who think that they are merely a story and not factually true, I would ask you to consider the fact that what you're calling into question here is the reliability of God's word as a whole. Because if certain bits of God's word are not true, then which bits of it can we believe? Which bits do we accept and which bits can we dismiss? This sceptical attitude also means you are calling into question the very nature of God, who, as the thrice holy God that he is, cannot lie. It also asks you to consider the fact that both Matthew and Luke record Jesus Christ referring to Noah, the ark and the flood as a historical event. And as he was the Son of God, what more authority do you, want, do you need to prove that this is a historical event? Then there is the issue that divides people who do not believe or who believe that there was a flood and that Noah built an ark. The issue that divides them is, was it regional or universal? Well, the waters, if you can pardon the pun, are muddied on this one by the fact that although elsewhere in Scripture phrases such as all the kings of the earth sought an audience with Solomon, 2 Chronicles chapter 9, verse 23, phrases such as that do not obviously mean that kings from places such as South America or Southeast Asia travelled to Jerusalem to meet with Solomon. And it is on the basis of this that some question the universality of the flood, preferring instead to believe that it was confined to a specific region. That, however, ignores the fact that the universal nature of this flood is emphasised repeatedly throughout this passage, using phrases such as all life under the heavens and all and are wrong and everything on earth will perish or every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out in hebrew if you want to emphasize the importance of something you repeat it and this fact is repeated several times throughout this story such a skeptical viewpoint also ignores the fact that if the area we now know as the Middle East was flooded to the degree that even the mountains were covered, then you could hardly expect the rest of the world's land masses to remain above water. There's also the fact that if we believe it could only be regional, then we're guilty of not only doubting the truthfulness of God's word, but also of doubting the power of God to act according to his will and fulfill his promises. And then finally, we need to remember that we can become so distracted by issues, issues such as these, which are in effect secondary, that we can miss the message the author wants us to take away from these verses. And with this in mind, I want us to consider three things this day that stand out in this section of scripture. Those three things are the righteousness of Noah, the judgment of God, and the salvation of God. The righteousness of Noah, the judgment of God, and the salvation of God. Firstly then, the righteousness of Noah. Verse 9 of chapter 6 tells us that Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Previous to this, in chapter 6, we, are, we learned how wicked mankind had become, that every inclination of humanity was evil. The situation was dire, so dire that the Lord was grieved that he had made mankind. But in the midst of the darkness, Noah stood out, contrasting completely with those around him. He was as different from them as sunshine is from darkness. Whilst the remainder 
of mankind grieved God, Noah found favour with him because he was a righteous man. But what was it about him, you may ask, that made him righteous in the sight of God? That is to say, made him acceptable to God. Well, the answer, or well, to answer that question, or the answer to that question lies in his humble attitude towards God. And the evidence of that is revealed in verse 22 of chapter 6, wherein we read that Noah did everything just as God commanded him. A statement follows the long list of instructions that God had given Noah, some of which I am sure Noah did not fully understand, and some of which made no sense to him whatsoever. Nevertheless, he did exactly as he was told. In Noah's case, this meant embarking on a project that was technologically challenging, to say the least. Building the ark as instructed by God. At 450 feet long, it was one and a half times the length of a football pitch. It was over twice as long as the biggest ever wooden sailing ship, the Cutty Sark. It meant backbreaking, painstaking work, cutting down countless trees, transporting and processing them over a period of 100 years. People reckon it took 6,000 odd trees to build Lord Nelson's HMS Victory. An HMS Victory would fit inside the ark twice over. Here Noah had to, so we don't know how many trees it would have taken to cut down, process and transport. Building a vessel that made no sense whatsoever to a sceptical watching world. As where he built it was nowhere near the sea, in a region that had normal annual rainfall. <clears throat> it meant planting, harvesting and storing crops on a scale never seen before. As well as gathering, transporting and storing huge quantities of other types of food. Aside from <clears throat> the work involved in all that, can you imagine the financial cost to Noah? as well as the cost to his reputation. <clears throat> I imagine that he was the laughing stock of the region, the butt of everyone's jokes. Come here, do you see what this boy's building? He says there's going to be a flood down here. But I also imagine that he was the subject to lots, or that he was subject to lots of abuse, both verbal and physical, given that the land was filled with violence, as we're told. So he would have been abused verbally and physically from people who were outraged when Noah explained to them why he was building the ark. Outraged at the suggestion that their lifestyle was unacceptable to God and that he was going to hold them accountable for it. <coughs> outraged that Noah, at Noah's insistence that the ark was the only means of salvation. Outraged that Noah had the audacity to claim that whilst the rest of humanity and life on earth would perish, God was going to save him, his family and those animals loaded onto the ark. But despite all of this, despite having to toil away for a hundred years, subject to all of the difficulties, Noah persisted in doing everything just as God commanded him. He didn't deviate from the instructions given to him. He didn't take shortcuts. He did not do what he thought was better. He took God at his word. And he followed that word to the letter. Here we see a man who feared God more than his fellow man. <clears throat> Here we see a man who valued God's acceptance of him more than the acceptance of the world around him. Noah's actions reveal that he trusted God without reservation. In other words, he had complete faith in God, he willingly, without reservation, rested everything on the bare word of God. Therefore, Noah's righteousness in the sight of God was simply because of his faith in him. His obedience to God was the fruit of that faith. It was the natural byproduct of his faith. Therefore, do not be mistaken. Obedience is the fruit of righteousness before God. Not the source of it. Noah was also described as being blameless among the people. But we must not make or take this to mean that he was sinless instead. It means that his life reflected a wholeness of character. In which what he professed to believe was actually how he lived his life. 
In other words, his faith influenced how he lived. It directed him in what he did and did not do. This meant that Noah's faith in God made him different from the people around him. So it saddens me when people profess to have put their faith in Christ, but yet the evidence of saving faith is non-existent in their lives. They claim to be children of God. They claim to be Christians. Yet they live as the world around us does. Its values and standards, not God's, are what they live by. They measure God's word against the values and standards of our culture as opposed to doing the exact opposite. They view God's word with a sceptical eye, a critical eye, as opposed to with an accepting one. They profess to love Christ, but yet by their actions they prove that they only love themselves because they value the acceptance and approval of people around them more than they value acceptance by God. They claim to fear God, but yet by their actions they prove that they fear the reproach of people around them more than they fear God's approach, reproach. <clears throat> Some people who claim to be Christians say that I and others like me are too serious, that we, we need to lighten up. But this shows how they have not grasped the central truth about faith in God, in that it is all or nothing. There is no halfway house in saving faith. There is no cosy accommodation of sin alongside saving faith. There is no picking and choosing which bits of God's word we want to adhere to and which bits we don't. If God's word is not the supreme rule of faith and practice in our lives, if it is not the standard which we measure everything against, then the faith that we profess to have is not in Christ. And it is therefore futile. Saving faith in Christ, faith that makes us righteous in God's sight, will make us different to the world around us. And because of this, we will incur the ridicule, rejection, and maybe even the wrath of others. We will do so because just as light reveals what was hitherto unseen, as we strive to live in obedience to God's word, our lifestyle will reveal the corruption in others. <clears throat> you know, I sometimes hear people say that they find it difficult to witness to others, and whilst they may have difficulty explaining the reason for the hope that they have in Christ, they've forgotten that their attitude and their actions should do most of the talking for them. We shouldn't have to tell people about our faith. They should see it in action every single day as we strive by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit to obey God in every area of our lives. We may be asked to explain why we live as we do. But we should never have to say people to people, oh by the way I'm a Christian. The righteousness of Noah is highlighted in these verses and so is the judgment of God. These verses paint a bleak picture of humanity describing him as being corrupt. And that's a strong word even in our culture as it speaks about the immoral dishonesty, immorality, dishonesty and unethical behaviour of someone a corrupt person cannot be trusted. They are shady characters and unreliable given that selfishness is their chief motivation. That is why they can be prone to using violence to get their own way. Corrupt people <clears throat> live by rules they get to make and can therefore justify just about anything to themselves. It doesn't matter what damage their actions cause others as long as they get what they want. In Noah's day we are told that humanity had corrupted their ways. Everything that they did was motivated by selfishness and greed. The net result of this being that the world was filled with violence. These people had rejected God completely. They lived as they wanted to, as they saw fit. Therefore God decreed that he would wipe them out. And the cataclysmic flood described for us in graphic detail in chapter 7 was the means by which he chose to do so. Therein in verses 11 and 12 we read that all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the, flood water, and the flood gates of the heavens were opened and rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Scholars tell us that the language used here describes what in effect was decreation. 
the undoing of God's creative work. The phrase burst forth describes the violent ripping apart of something. So it would seem that seismic shifts in the Earth's crust caused subterranean waters held deep beneath the oceans of the world to be released with destructive force into the oceans above them, thereby dramatically raising the sea levels and causing, possibly causing huge tsunamis. And on top of that, the floodgates of the heavens opened, releasing torrential rain that lasted for 40 days and 40 nights. It was merciless and unceasing. I imagine that as rivers burst their banks and low-lying areas flooded, people made their way onto the higher ground. But as they climbed, so did the water level. There was no escaping it, as eventually even the highest mountains were covered by 20 feet of water. I imagine there were some who had rudimentary boats, but even if they were not swamped by the deluge from the sky, their occupants would not have lasted very long without shelter from the elements and enough food to last them for the duration of the flood. There was no escaping the flood. It totally destroyed everything that God chose to destroy. As such then, it is a stark reminder that no one who lives in opposition to God escapes his judgment. No one escapes his righteous wrath. If we reject God in this life, if we rail against his authority, the Bible tells us that we will face his rejection and judgment in eternity. We may think that we can escape it, but we can't. Nothing we attempt will save us. All our human endeavours will be in vain. We may take shelter in what we believe to be a citadel of religious devotion, but it will be washed away. We may climb the hills of what we believe to be noteworthy actions and attainments, but they will be overwhelmed. We may climb into a craft of what we believe to be our exemplary lifestyle, but it will be swamped. God's judgment is terrible. It is inescapable, and it leaves no survivors amongst those whom God deems corrupt. Of course, we may think that God has no right or reason to condemn us, but that is to forget that he is the potter and we are the clay. And the fact that God's judgment about us, not us, not ours about ourselves, or him, is all that counts. Hebrews 10, 31 tells us, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, and that is what will happen to all who reject God in this life. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because here in these verses, the salvation of God is also, also highlighted. God was grieved with the sinfulness of humanity, that they had rebelled against him, and in doing so they had sold themselves short. Living with adherence, adherence to God's word, cut off from him by their sin, what they thought was life was in reality only in existence. It grieved God that the pinnacle of his creation had become rotten to the core, poisoned by sin, so he decreed that he would wipe them out. He could, of course, have wiped out the whole of humanity, but he didn't. Instead, he chose to save one man and his immediate family. Noah was a righteous man, yes, but he was still a sinful man, so God was not obliged to save him. Therefore, his actions in doing so reveal his amazing grace towards Noah. In chapter 6, verse 13, it says that God told Noah about the coming judgment. And then in verses 14 to 21, he told Noah how he could be saved from that judgment. He offered Noah a way out. He offered him a means of salvation. Noah, being a righteous man, took God at his word and did everything just as God commanded him. The ark was built. The supplies of food and animals were loaded. Then he and his family entered and as verse 16 of chapter 7 tells us, the Lord shut him in. Then God's judgment was unleashed upon the world. But whilst every one and, and every living thing outside of the ark perished, Noah and all who were with him in the ark were saved. Noah took God at his word. He heeded his warning. 
and he followed God's instructions on how he could be saved and he was but he was not saved by his ingenuity nor by his craftsmanship he was saved by his faith in God which caused him to listen to and obey God and you know the account of Noah and the flood serves both as a warning and an encouragement to us even in this modern age It warns us that we would do well to listen to God and follow the instructions he has given us on how we can be saved from his coming judgment. This judgment is spoken of by the Apostle Peter in the second letter that bears his name. But this was not just a figment of his imagination. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, he had heard Jesus speak about it on a number of occasions. Indeed, on one such occasion, As recorded by Matthew in chapter 24 and Luke in chapter 17, it was while he was speaking on the subject of judgment that he made reference to Noah, the ark and the flood. It was Christ himself who told a crowd of people listening to him, unless you repent, you too will all perish. But not only does God's word speak about the coming judgment, it also speaks about God's means of salvation. The Apostle Paul, when asked by the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved, replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But Paul didn't make that up. Because it was Christ himself who said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So you see, like Noah To avail of God's salvation, all we need to do is take God at his word and do what he tells us. But unlike Noah, we don't have to construct the means of our salvation. Because God has already done that for us through Christ, who died for sin and rose again. It is through the cross that Christ has provided us with an ark of salvation from the coming judgment. But only those who enter in will be saved. Only those who are in Christ, only those who trust in his sacrifice at Calvary, will escape. You know, I imagine that as Noah ascended the loading ramp of the ark that day, he did so with a mixture of joy and sadness. Joy that the Lord had granted him salvation And deep sadness that despite all his efforts, his friends and neighbours wouldn't believe him and would therefore perish because of their unbelief. Therefore, as your pastor and your friend, whilst I have joy in my heart, knowing that God has shut me in, that he has secured me in Christ, even though I don't deserve it, it saddens me to know that so many people will perish because of their unbelief. Christ awaits you. Will you enter in? Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you do not expect us to construct the means of our salvation as Noah had to do. You have provided that for us. Christ has done all the work for us at Calvary. All you ask is we trust and obey. All you ask is that we enter in. Lord, give us believing hearts, trusting hearts. Help us, Lord, this day, if we have not already done so, to enter into Christ, that we too may be saved. Amen. Our closing praise highlights this important truth. In Christ alone, let us stand to sing.
remind the members of the committee to remain behind briefly. And now may the love of the Lord Jesus Christ draw us to himself. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen us in his service. May the joy of the Lord Jesus fill our souls and the blessing of God Almighty, God the Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you always. Amen.